When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you, I am he. If you're looking for me, 
then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I'm not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Then Jesus, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now, it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, 
My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. <laughs> what is truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews and gathered there, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against this man, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Pas Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. When I read this through um, during this week, one thing that struck me was the people should have known better. The people that Jesus came to should have known better. And it is actually someone who doesn't know who examines Jesus who finds no case against him. And it's quite a contrast, isn't it? The ones who have religious power, and I'm sorry when I wear this, I always get paranoid of that, religious power, and shake hands with power structures, tend to be the ones who cannot see what peace is supposed to be like and what truth is all about. I get the impression that the religious leaders whether they got the evidence or not, had already made their mind up that they wanted Jesus to be killed. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a discussion with somebody, and no matter how clear you've presented, perhaps your case, it does not matter, because they've already made the decision. Pilate strikes me as someone who examines... Jesus for himself and concludes that there is nothing wrong with this man. And so it's the outsider, Pilate, who is bemused at the behavior of the insiders. Why do these people want this man crucified? Although that comes a little later. But why do they want him arrested? What is it they want? Because Pilate doesn't seem to see Jesus in the same way, does he? Now, I love the phrase, what is truth? It's a bit of a throwaway line from Pilate. Um, but really, he says, I don't find anything wrong with this man. And of course, that's not enough to convince those that hold power. See, the problem with Jesus is Jesus was coming to reform and restore, really, the Jewish kind of religion and structures. And that was threatening to those people who had built their life on the power trip they got from those positions. And so, really, it's ego that tends to want to accuse Jesus and crucify him. And there was a lot of that going round in the story. Right at the end, I think Pilate, who is sort of the one who's in charge of the affairs of the Emperor of Rome, would have been shocked, I think, that the people shouted they wanted somebody like Barabbas released rather than Jesus. Because Barabbas is probably like somebody who would be a leader of, say, ISIS in the present day. So I think Pilate would have been shocked thinking, what are they picking 
a known terrorist to be released for over this man. The insiders choose violence and they reject peace because they do not want to change. They do not want to reflect. They do not want to become the true people of God they are called to be. The insiders choose violence and reject peace. And I wonder whether the world we live in is exactly the same. Why is it we choose violence instead of peace? Is it because we have become so accustomed to violence, them and us, in and out thinking, that it is far too difficult to think compassionately about this world? I don't think all of the Jewish nation that clapped Jesus in asked for Barabbas. It was the people in power who were the guardians of what they perceived to be truth who crucified the one who was for the people. So let's reflect in our first little thoughts about this. Why is it that we have a bent to choose hatred over love or indifference compared to love? Is it that only in Christ the truth of who we are breaks this cycle and tendency for violence and power? Let us really think today whether if we are asked the question whether we would choose peace or whether we would choose our own egos. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became the to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life. I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again.
Pilate took Jesus and had him flocked. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews together who gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave me no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a palace known as the Stone Pavement, which in Arabic is Gabatha. It was a day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which is in Aramaic, is Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Jesus answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopos, and Mary Magdalene. 
When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Mother, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture should be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the body left on the cross during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies that so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. As another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. (coughs) Nicodemus brought a mixture of mare and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, The two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation And since the tomb was nearby, there lay Jesus there. Amen. Now, I remember when I did my undergraduate study, and I had to write my dissertation. And if anybody knows what I'm like when it comes to writing, you will know that I tend to have the most catastrophic mental breakdowns when I've got to put things in writing. Stand me up and ask me what I think and I'll tell you what I think. Tell me to write it down and you will have no idea what is going on. It's very worrying and stressful. So when I handed in my undergraduate dissertation, I handed it in and thought, it's finished. It's done. I'm never doing this again. It is finished is what Jesus says on the cross. And he's not saying, I'm done with this now, it's over, it's finished, it's dead. It's probably better to hear Jesus saying, it is now complete. My work is fulfilled. Jesus says in another story, he uses this idea of a kernel of wheat and he says unless it falls to the ground and dies 
it remains alone. But if it falls to the ground and it dies, it more fruit will spring up as a result of it. Probably, for those that crucified Jesus, for them, this looks like the end. But for Jesus, this is the beginning of something brand new. This is now the completed action that allows the seed of Jesus to be spread across the world. The seed has now fallen and it's time for harvest. It's interesting that Jesus on the cross looks at those who have crucified him and tells them that he has finished and completed what he was sent to do. It is as if he takes back the power and says, this was everything that I was called to be and do. He really says to darkness, do the best you can because this is the plan which will confuse and confound the darkness. Jesus says it is complete. It is finished and it's not a sign of resignation. That's it now. It's all over. You may as well go back to your old lives. No, he says this is the starting point for a new revolution in this world. One that is grounded on mercy and grace and love. I often think about, I'll probably get the character wrong here, the film Braveheart. And there's a scene in Braveheart where he's being, he's being tortured, he's being killed. And is it Robert the Bruce who was always kind of undercover and talking to him and he betrays Braveheart and then he watches Braveheart be martyred. And suddenly the martyrdom of Braveheart inspires this man to go on the battlefield and lead the troops of Braveheart. It's as if the death of the champion throws the baton into somebody else's hands. And actually what Jesus does is he throws his life now into the hands of this world. The seed spills out now. Jesus refuses to be a player of ego and self-preservation, but gives himself for this world. Today we don't just remember the cross in itself. If we were there and we were Jesus' followers and all our hopes were in him, it would have been seen as an absolute travesty. We probably would be in hiding now if we were at this point in time. Because this is brutal. The Jewish leaders have lost it. They're even telling Pilate how to do his job now. So inflamed they are. So if you was a follower of Jesus, you would be frightened for your life. But Jesus says, it is fulfilled. It is now completed. The time of the new order of things is coming and will continue to grow. This is what I call the kingdom of God. A place where all are welcome, all are given dignity and value and worth and all are transformed from ways of death into ways of life. And that transformation happens because Christ, just like that kernel of wheat, falls to the ground and dies so that he might give the seed of his life and salvation for us. Let us be grateful that Christ chose the cross. 
that he chose a way of submission rather than violence so that we could see our loved, valued and worthiness and so that we could be champions and carriers of the seed that may seem to be fallen to the ground today but something else will happen very, very soon. Let's just pause in quiet reflection. Lord, we thank you today for your humility that you became flesh and you dwell amongst us showing us grace and truth that you embodied the kingdom of God a place of love and joy and fellowship and hospitality and welcome and yet we know Lord that you was on a crash course with those in power who didn't want a reform that put everybody at the table. They didn't want a reform that made you take the guest lists from them and say they don't exist and it's not your property. People chose violence over salvation. And yet you transformed that choice into a gateway of life for this world. And so we thank you that you humbled yourself and you became obedient even to death, death on a cross, that we might receive the seed of new life from the Christ who gave himself for us. We praise you in grateful thanks. Amen. Oh, my God.